Married six months and their families are finding it painfully hard to come to terms with the tragedy. During our reconstruction, you'll hear the actual voice of a man police are desperately trying to trace. We begin at a shopping precinct in Tunbridge Wells, where Nicola had been working part-time. Oh, that's nice. Is it for someone special? Well, for my boyfriend. Would you like some ribbon? Yes, please. Nicky was a shy, private, quiet, dainty little girl, really. Yeah. I hope he likes it. I'm sure you will. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Harry was just the opposite. Um, he was considerably older than her. Um, a very likable character, though, larger than life, but he seemed to come from a different way of life than that we were used to. Uh, he brought Nikki out of her shell, and, and she seemed to really enjoy life, being with him. Right you are, then. OK, you're a gentleman. Just leave it to me. No problem. Cheers, mate. Harry was always very protective towards Nicky. There was always a house full of flowers. They met in June and the wedding was in August. The whole thing we thought was rather, rather quick, but it was like a roller coaster once it started. There was, there was no way of stopping it. But again, they were very happy. We we grew to like him very much. Um, he used to come here to Sunday lunch most weekends. Um, he seemed to be looking for a, a sort of a, a family unit, and he certainly became a, a very popular member of the family. Hello? OK, mate. But leave it to me. Harry Fuller bought and sold cars. Notes. Most of his business was it done on the phone. Much, I don't know, but if you leave it to me, I'll try and get it down a bit. No problem at all. OK, cheers. Although he didn't read or write well, he had an eye for a good deal. A lot of his transactions were done in cash, and he often carried large amounts of money around. Lot number 201, lot number 201 coming in, the Vauxhall Cavalier, the 1600L, January of 1989... The day before he died, Harry spent the early part of the afternoon with a friend. I've known Harry for about 13 years. I asked him to get me a vehicle because having bought me one before, I knew he'd get me something reasonable. And I spent a couple of hours on that day with him at the auctions. Now, Harry was always buying cars and uh, looking for somewhere to store them. Um, when he uh, got the house at Wadhurst, it was like him winning the pools because he got a free car park there for all the cars he wanted to park. It was last October that Harry and Nicola had moved to Sussex and rented Blackman's Cottage in Wadhurst. It's Tuesday evening. Nicola was going out to a reunion with some friends at a restaurant in Tunbridge Wells. Okay. I'd better go and get ready. Oh, your friend phoned earlier on, but she's going to ring you back later. A few days right. earlier, Harry started recording his phone calls. No one knows why. This is the only caller police haven't been able to identify. How are you doing? Very well indeed. It couldn't be better. I popped over last night to see you. What time? About seven. I was up the gym, up at the um, golf club oh. at Tysus. There were some lights on, but I knocked them. Right. See you in the morning, my darling. Hey, Eight o'clock. Bye. Ciao for now. Harry was a late riser, and to agree to an early morning meeting was very unlike him. Oh, it's Harry. He's on time. Harry had arranged to meet Nicola at the restaurant at about 11 o'clock to bring her home. Thursday. You're going Thursday. Yeah. Nicky was one of my closest friends. We'd known each other for a number of years. We used to go out together. Yeah, I hope so. It'd be a nice break, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Harry. Hello. <laughs> Mickey and Harry seemed very happy together. They were going on holiday to Lanzarote the following week. She was really excited about going to get suntan before the summer. <laughs> Early the next morning, a postman was startled by a car pulling out from behind the Fuller's cottage. It's normally very quiet in the morning, 
A dirty blue Ford Escort pulled out in front of me, which caught me by surprise. The passenger seemed 35 to 40, tall and well built, and the vehicle travelled towards Tunbridge Wells. Half an hour later, at about seven o'clock, a witness saw two men get out of a cream-coloured Sierra and walk up the path to the cottage. The witness who saw these men gave the information anonymously. Police need him to contact them again. Hello, old son. Nobody saw the two men leave, but we know that Harry went out of the cottage about an hour and a half later, leaving the door ajar. Good morning, can I help you? 20 Embassy number one, please. Thank you. 226, thank you. That's 10 pounds, thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks cheers. Right. Nikki had gone to a reunion on Tuesday night and I hadn't spoken or seen her since Sunday. So I decided to ring her at 8... 9, 8.45, and I rang and the line was engaged, and I continued to ring every five minutes until quarter past nine. Nicola and Harry Fuller had been shot dead just ten minutes after Harry's visit to the tobacconist. You know, she just seems to have found happiness and then suddenly snatched away from her, which seems dreadful. Absolutely dreadful. Anyone could do that to her. I feel that this part of me has gone. And there is this big hole, it's never going to be filled. And I do miss her so. Well, of course, it's going to be absolutely crucial, isn't it, Superintendent Hill, to discover who that unidentified caller is. We can listen to that call again. Our engineers have taken Harry's voice out of the tape you're about to hear, so that the only voice on the tape is the caller's voice. Do you know who this is? How are you doing? Can we take the first thing? Too early, boys. About eight. I popped over last night to see you. There were some lights on. He's gone away. He's left them with his missus. So we'll zip down there. Won't be long. About, what, 10, 15 minutes? They're down the other side of Roberts Bridge. Down now. So that's just the caller's side of the conversation. And that meeting was arranged very close to the time that Nicola and Harry were killed. So until this man comes forward, he's got to be your prime suspect. It's absolutely crucial we find this man. Um, so far, we haven't found him and he hasn't come forward. There may be some reason for that, um, but we really need to find him. And uh, I would ask anybody who's listening tonight who either recognises his voice or who thinks they recognise his voice to please make contact with us. Alternatively, if the man concerned is listening and he himself uh, wants to contact us for us to eliminate him then please contact us do you think he might be called steve or well there's an indication that he might be called steve however i would want uh, anybody who might recognize the voice irrespective of whether the person is called steve or not to contact us now you want the witness who saw the men in the cream sierra to come forward again but you have another witness who saw another car and a man early that morning that's correct just after eight o'clock that morning in the car park at the rear of blackman's cottage uh, a lady saw a long black bonneted vehicle, something like a Jaguar, uh, pull up and a man get out of the vehicle and he was fairly distinctive in that he was wearing a very long black coat, almost to the ground. Um, we would like anybody else who saw that man or indeed saw the vehicle to make contact with us. And if you know who that voice was on the phone call, if you can shed any light at all on this case, please do call us. There's a substantial reward for information leading to arrest and charge. The number here in the studio is 0818118181. Our lines here are very busy as they were last month, so do take a special note of the incident room number at Sussex Police Headquarters, and that's 0273 480999. Almost everyone's good friend, it seems. Generous, gregarious, and though no one knew where it had come from, he had plenty of money. He relished popularity. He had lots of friends and lots of girlfriends. But clearly not everyone was so impressed by Mr. Shippey. Someone decided to kill him. And maybe in the next 10 minutes after this reconstruction, we'll discover who they are and why they did it. Doves is in South Croydon, Surrey. And after working there for almost quarter of a century, John Shippey had risen from a junior in the accounts department to become the finance director. 
Since his death, the business has discovered that about three quarters of a million pounds has been siphoned from their subsidiary finance company over a period of at least eight years. Now I'm going to the cricketers. Then I'm going to get some agreements signed. OK, have a nice weekend. You too, darling. Bye. I'd known John for nearly eight years, ever since I joined the company. He was a big man. He had lots of presents. You always knew when he was in a room. If you had a problem and you asked him to solve your problem, he'd always try to do it. His local was the cricketers, and um, he had used the pub for many, many years, for both business and for pleasure. Here he comes, boy. Yeah, was you in trouble? Was you all right? Yeah. All right, John. Hello, John. Hello. John was a very outgoing man. Hello, <laughs> lad. That's a lad. That's from the pub in the cricketers. All right, John. Now then, what's this about Friday? Everybody all right for it? Yeah, no, John lived his life in thousands of little compartments. You didn't really cross over from one to the other unless you really allowed you to. All right, lads, who's up for snacking? He was a completely larger than life character. A very kind, generous man, and just good fun to be with. <laughs> I just cannot think of any reason at all why anyone would want to do any harm to John at all. The night of Saturday, the 14th of December, 1991. John and one of his girlfriends, Carol, had dinner with Joe Kavanagh and his wife at a local restaurant. <laughs> you sure don't want to drink, John? No, no, no. no I'm knocking it on the head until after Christmas. And tell them about the new boat. Mm -mm. No. Got it? Yeah. Mm. Where'd you get the white one? Yeah, water footer. You ready for Spain in May? Yeah. Is everything all right? Great. Yeah. As usual. Osman, since it's Christmas, why don't you take a photograph? Here you are. Cheers, John. Are you down at Palace tomorrow? No, no, I've got an appointment. Oh, see you Monday or week. Yeah, sure. Cheers. How about that? The four of them left the restaurant at about one o'clock, and John drove Carol to the house he'd helped her buy in Item in Kent. Although he owned a number of homes, he spent much of his time here and would normally stay with Carol at the weekend. But theirs was a volatile relationship, and that night they had a sudden row. John left the house between two and three in the morning in his blue Ford Sierra Sapphire. It wasn't until three days later that Carol realised something might be wrong. Hello? Hi, Carol. It's Charles. Oh, hello, Joe. How are you? All right, thanks. You haven't seen John at all, have you? He hasn't been down the pictures for a couple of days now. No, I haven't seen him since Saturday. In fact, I've had doves on the phone saying he missed an important meeting yesterday. It's not like him at all. I'm beginning to get quite worried. 20 miles west of Item, the M25 crosses the M23 near the village of Merstham. Later that night, a witness was approaching the village on his way back from a badminton match. I was driving along Rockshaw Road uh, towards Warwick's Wall, and um, I became aware of a car in front who was driving erratically. Uh, the driver and the passenger were looking in both directions and became nervous when I came up behind them. The moment I overtook them and went to look in and see exactly who was in the car, um, they both deliberately turned away. So I really only had a look at the back of their heads. The small network of roads next to the motorway is usually quiet, leading only to a scattering of private houses or to a nearby gypsy camp. Yet at 10 to 11, another witness saw something there that struck him as peculiar. As I passed the junction of Rockshaw Road and continued down towards Warwick's Road, there were two cars parked on the near side. The car I came to first 
was a Ford Cortina and the car in front of that was a blue Ford Sierra with a man leaning into the back of the passenger compartment and uh, as I passed them I picked up the headlights in the mirror of the car which uh, I thought was odd if one of the cars had broken down that both of them had got their headlights on. Just down the road, a couple was watching Newsnight. Oh my God, what was that? I Sound like a couple on the motorway. But you stay here, I'll have a look. No, no, I'll come with you. Having picked my wife up and entered Warwick's world again, there was a blue Sierra which was completely engulfed in flames. And I thought at the time that was the car that I'd just seen previously and passed about 20 minutes earlier. Fire and rescue. Yeah, what's the address? In Merstham. Has a car fire, Warwick Wold, Merstham. We're on our way, sir. There'd been a spate of abandoned cars in this area, and this witness was compiling a video of them. John Shippey's body was found in the boot of his burnt-out Sierra. He died from stab wounds. These are identical glasses to the ones he was wearing. They're Cephalo sporting glasses. They're missing, as is this watch, which is uh, a fairly distinctive Seiko watch. So if you've seen these uh, abandoned somewhere, and John Beavis, the cases, we saw him putting identical cases to these into the back of his blue Sierra Sapphire, the cases are missing too. Yes, they are. Um, he kept all his personal and uh, business papers in these uh, cases, and he wouldn't go anywhere without them. The larger one is a Samsonite, hard grey plastic. The other one is a maroon leather case, both with combination locks. I would very much like to know where those cases are. Now, let's just fix dates in people's minds. This is ten days before Christmas. It was a bitterly cold night that, uh, that Sunday night. Certainly. Sunday morning, there would have been a very heavy frost on the car. Now, there was this three, four days between uh, his last sighting and the discovery of the car. So somewhere, that blue Ford Sierra Tafar went uh, during that period. It must have been garaged somewhere, left out on the streets. It, it's critical to our investigation. We must know where that car was. It was certainly somewhere for those three days. H613 CWS, as you can see, where do you think it probably was? What sort of area? I would say it was in eastern Surrey, uh, north west Kent, maybe south London, Croydon, those sort of areas. Uh, it may have been outside a lock-up, someone may have seen it obstructing their driveway. We really must find out where that car was for those three days. Now there was an implication, as we, as we saw in the reconstruction, that he had an appointment on the Sunday. Yes, despite all the people we've seen, and we've seen um, numerous members of his close associates and business asso acquaintances, um, nobody has mentioned having that appointment with him on that Sunday, and I would very much like to hear from anybody who's made arrangements to meet John on that Sunday, the, the 15th of, de of December. We heard how he sort of compartmentalised his, his life. I mean, do, do you think you've now spoken to everybody who knew him? No, he was a very complex character indeed, and in fact the, the way he compartmentalised his life has made my inquiry even more difficult. Um, I w there's possibly parts of his life now uh, that we haven't actually entered into, and uh, if anybody else uh, who's listening to this programme who knew John Shippey, was a girlfriend of John Shippey, had business dealings with John Shippey, who we haven't spoken to, please contact us. Just, uh, it's a bit of a long shot this, but Three canisters like this, camping canisters, canisters of gas, butane gas, were what detonated that explosion in the car. Now, each of them has serial numbers on the bottom, and the three in the back of the car, the serial number is 00491. And if you sold those to somebody before Sunday the 15th of December, remember anything about them, 00491, do please give us a call. Mr. Beavis and his colleagues are, are waiting for anybody who's got any information. Here's the number, 81 Remember, if you prefer, you can speak to a BBC researcher. Or you can call Rygate Police Station direct. That's on 0737 765 040.
this program. Cases where a person is murdered by someone unknown to them are very rare. Our next appeal is sadly one of the exceptions. We've changed the name of the key witness in the reconstruction which follows, which takes place in Wakefield on the day of the murder. It's Tuesday, 15th of March. Wendy Speaks had lived here for nearly 11 years. Every morning she followed the same routine before she left for work. My mum was very happy living on her own. She had lots of friends, but she was a very private person. Um, she kept herself to herself. And um, really, um, she didn't have any particular best friends as such. It was more myself and my sister. It was the three of us together, really. My mum used to call us the three musketeers. And um, she was like the big sister. I was very proud to have her as my mum. Uh, she always took care about how she looked and her house. Her house was always very smart and neat. And she got everything she wanted in her life. Wendy was the receptionist at a marketing company on the outskirts of Wakefield. She set off for the bus stop each morning at about half past eight. An hour later, less than a mile from Wendy's house, Julie Smith was waiting for her bus to work. I noticed this man coming towards me. He passed by really close. I remember he was acting strange, looking about him a lot. By then, the bus had arrived and I didn't see him again after that. Look, I'm sorry about this, David. It's just that with Tracy living down south, and I'm 52 next birthday. Recently, Wendy had decided to leave that. Wakefield, and at work that afternoon, she handed in her notice. And thanks for all the work you've done for us. Oh, well, thanks, thanks, David. Thank you. It's now five o'clock. Julie had finished work and was on her way home. As the bus pulled up at her stop, she herself didn't notice the man she'd seen that morning still hanging around. I realised that he was watching the young lady, what lives next door, and he stood there for a moment. I was wondering if you could help me. I've been walking around for two hours trying to find Flanshaw Drive. Do you have any idea where it is? I'm not quite sure. I think it might be down off Flanshaw Road. He was acting strange, shifting around, and that's when I remembered him from the morning. I realised he was lying about the amount of time he'd been in the area. It made me nervous. I didn't get all that. Could you get me a pen and paper? I'm better off just saying it to you. I remember he looked in his late 30s. He had brown eyes and, and was sort of medium build. I think he had a local accent. Turn left down by the hotel. By now I was really scared and I didn't know what I was saying. I thought he might push me inside. Could I come in and use your phone? Uh, no, definitely not. Anyway, my boyfriend's in the kitchen and he, he wouldn't like it. Look, I'm really sorry. I, I can't help you anymore. Okay. I never normally open the door to strangers, but I suppose he caught me off guard. Wendy's bus from work would have arrived at Wakefield Town Centre at around six o'clock. From here, it was just a short walk home. You may have seen her walking along Balm Lane. Screen printer was nearing the end of his shift. The factory is directly across the street from Wendy's house. I was looking out the window. The only reason why they caught me I is because I've never seen anybody call in the house before. I'm pretty sure the woman lives here, but I've never seen the man before. Perhaps 
the man was going through the same routine. Perhaps he'd asked Wendy for pen and paper. Hey! I remember being called away to the machine for a few minutes. When I returned to the window, the guy was leaving. Didn't feel much of it at the time. Wendy's body was discovered the next day when she failed to turn up for work. She'd been stabbed several times. One pair of blow shoes. A pair of shoes at the scene didn't belong to Wendy. And some of Wendy's own shoes had been disturbed. We've all been affected so deeply, it's more than you ever imagine. Our life is just on hold, really, until the man responsible is caught. Some days we're, we were very angry, and some days we're just numb. Um, and it's just such a memory was such a big part of our lives that it's just difficult to, to see how your life can be normal again. Is this working? <laughs> I just miss her all the time. She's on my mind all the time. And may the love you share today be always of the best. These moments you will treasure because they mean the most. So let us raise our glasses and while I propose a toast to the bride and groom. Bride and groom. Well, that was just last September at Wendy's daughter's wedding. Detective Superintendent Taylor, what was the motive for Wendy's death? I'm quite satisfied that when this man knocked on Wendy's door, his intention was to sexually assault her, which he did, and kill her. And he came prepared and brought certain items with him to do that. One of those items was a pair of shoes. What's the significance of those shoes? Well, the shoes are vitally important to the inquiry, and it is very important that we find the owner of these shoes. They were left outside a charity shop in Wakefield on Saturday the 12th of March. The assistant at the shop found them in a bag outside, took them in, priced them up and placed them on the shelf and does remember a man purchasing them later on in the day. So that was just three days before the murder? That's right, yes. Do you know what size these are? No. Could you try them on for me, please? Do you mind? It's too small for me. Why, what size are you? Seven. These must be a five or six. OK, I'll take them. Now, we didn't use the actual pair of shoes in the film there. What did the actual pair of shoes look like? We've got a picture of them there. Yes, the actual shoes were last manufactured perhaps six years ago and have R.P. Ellen Oxford Street on the inside. So it's very important that the owner should contact you yes. if they recognise that? The owner who got rid of those shoes wherever in Wakefield, please contact us. You need to confirm that the man who tried those shoes on is the, is the, the man you're looking for? We do indeed. He also brought a piece of candlewick material with him. Yes, this was part of uh, what he brought to the scene. It is a candlewick bedspread and firms in the area of Wakefield actually cut these up into rags and they are sold. And it might be another link in the chain to identify the man. And a pair of stockings that he brought too? Yes, he, he prepared a pair of stockings and tied loops in them about 15 inches down from the top, which, although he didn't use them, uh, would have fitted over someone's wrists. And it may be that someone in the past can piece that together. What sort of man do you think would commit a crime like this? Well, we've spoken to uh, a friend of profilers and witnesses, uh, and we've put together what we think is uh, a picture of this man. He didn't alarm uh, Wendy, so he would be of normal appearance and voice. Uh, normal intelligence. I think that he may be local, although I don't discount that he could be just a visitor to the area. One of the witnesses described the possibility of some dark bands around the top of the arms on his uh, bomber style jacket which is the same as the prison service issue uh, and therefore he may have been a previous offender for sexual offences and the most disturbing part of all is that it may form part of a series and he could well strike again so you think there may be a prison connection and that he may want to commit more crimes like this which means it's really important to find him what does it, he look like it's very disturbing yes 
His description is of a man 35 to 45, 5 foot 6 to 5 foot 9. He is receding with short light brown hair and greyish and balding. I believe he had a Yorkshire accent too. Yes, he did have a Yorkshire accent. And what we are seeking to achieve from Crime Watch this evening is to put all the pieces together of the stockings, the candlewick material, the description, and hopefully somebody can ring in and put a name to this man who must be caught. Right. Well, if any of those details seem at all familiar to you, I can't stress too much. Please don't hesitate to ring. Uh, of a 76-year-old man killed for the sake of just a few pounds in takings at the pet shop where he worked. Arthur Broomhill had lived in Northampton all his life, and our reconstruction goes back exactly eight weeks to January the 21st. Arthur had worked at Denton's Pet Shop in Wellingborough Road for the past 11 years. Yeah. A good boy, aren't you, eh? yes, you are. Since his retirement from running his own business, he'd made his love of animals the centre of Thank his you, life. Good to see your friends. There you are. Good boy. Night night. He thrived on the contact with people too, and almost everyone in the neighbourhood knew and liked him. Well, my father was a wonderfully kind person, very gentle, quietly spoken, but a great sense of humour. We've had some very moving letters from children saying how much they loved him and how they'd bought their pets from him. Obviously it was such a great shock to my mother and myself and the rest of the family and we're coping um, but we are in a sort of limbo simply because until the person that did this is caught we can't have a funeral and we're just we're just about coping but it's very difficult Thursday the 21st of January the day Arthur died he'd Hello. been in charge of the shop for a fortnight while the owners were away I got your orders for you. Oh, that's great. Thanks a lot. There you are. How much do I owe you? Uh, £3.80. I've known Arthur for about four years, and he was a lovely man, very friendly, very helpful, and we always had a chat. Very busy, yes. Have you? Well, the Dentons have been away, you see, so oh, have they? I've been here all on my own, working late at night. When he told me he'd been staying late, cashing up, I must admit I was very concerned. No, 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 no. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. It's now 5.30. Hello there. Oh, are you still open? Yes, you're in luck. I was just closing. Oh, good. Have you got any guinea pigs? Yes, come and have a look. Now, this is a very friendly one. Very docile. Is it a male or a female? To be honest, I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. I like that. It's a really nice one. Yeah, Jolly like good. That. I'll put it in a box for you. Right, thanks very much. Well, good night then. Bye then. Good night. Four hours later, Arthur was still there. I was on my way home and I take the same route every night going down the Wellingborough Road. The time was somewhere between half past nine and twenty to ten and as I went past the pet shop I noticed the lights was on. I saw two people in there. One was the shopkeeper and it looked as if the other person was a friend or somebody that he knew. This is the last time Arthur is known to have been seen alive. At about 20 past 10, round the corner from the shop, this woman was arriving home after an evening out. As I walked across towards my house, I saw a man hanging about by Stone Wright Memorials, and he looked really suspicious, and I sensed that he was watching me. He knew that I'd seen him. I, I actually had eye-to-eye -eye contact with him. And after that, I sensed that he watched me all the way to the door. And as I got to my door, I looked back once more, and he was still watching me. Between five and ten minutes later, I looked out of my front door, and the man had gone. Early the next morning, another man drew the attention of several local people. I was on the Wellingborough Road, which is right opposite the pet shop, and I happened to notice this chap on the corner and he seemed to be acting very suspiciously. He was just peering round the Wellingborough Road as if he didn't want to be seen. 
It made me think that he was up to no good. 20 minutes later, a couple of streets away. I was going down to get my newspaper, I could do every morning. It's about a couple of minutes walk down to the shop and back. When I see him, I thought he was coming out to get a bus and then he suddenly turned round and went back. I sort of didn't take a lot of notice of him the first time. I carried on down the road further to the next junction and I see the same chap and he was throwing something which I thought was rather peculiar. I just carried on and uh, went and got me paper and when I came out, he was there again. I, you know, I looked straight at him. He got blood down the front of his rack suit. At half past eight, the assistant arrived at the shop to start work. Morning, Arthur. He found Arthur's body. He'd received several heavy blows to the head. Oh, Bob Thorogood, you do know what the murder weapon was? Yes, it was a tyre lever exactly like this one. One like that is missing from the shop. The man in the yellow tracksuit was seen throwing something. Could that have been what it was he was throwing? Yes, it could. It was about the same length. Um, and although where he threw it, the rubbish was cleared away, it may be that someone's taken it home. I do need to recover that quickly. Whatever it was, even if it wasn't a tyre lever, if you saw it, please give us a ring. What description do you have exactly of the man in the yellow tracksuit? Well, he was in his mid-thirties. He was about six feet tall with blonde hair and on the morning he looked quite dishevelled. And what about the, the other man in yellow seen the night before, the, the night that Arthur died? Yes, of course, that was a very different yellow jacket. It was like a road worker's fluorescent jacket. And he was in his early 30s, about 5 feet 10, with short dark hair. But he was clearly a different man from the other one. You're convinced of that. What about the description of the man seen in the shop with Arthur shortly before he died? He was in his late teens, about 5 feet 5, with mousy brown hair. And there's, there'd been no forced entry into the shop? No, that's right. There hadn't. And we believe from that that Arthur may have let the person in. But there was a window open upstairs and on the outside, on the windowsill, was a boot mark like that, a very distinctive sole. And that was the one uh, going out? It looked as if it was out. someone going out of the shop, yes. And you've received two mysterious letters? Yes, I'm most anxious to speak to whoever wrote those letters. If you recognise either of those letters, please um, get in contact again. In fact, any detail you can give to Mr Thorakud could be vital. If you saw anything that Thursday night, it was the 21st of January, or if you know of any possible reason why anyone would want to kill Mr. Broomhill, please ring. The number here is 081-811-8181, or you can ring the Northampton Police Headquarters on 0604-700-700. And watch viewers tonight to help them make sense of a murder. Jacqueline Palmer Radford was well liked. She lived with her two sons in the Hampshire village of Eversley near Reading, and her life really revolved around the children. Eleven weeks ago, she was found dead at her home. Jacqueline's sons are played and are filmed by actors and have been given fictitious names. Our reconstruction begins in Eversley on Tuesday the 31st of March, the day before her death. Do you need any help with your homework tonight, Sam? Yeah, that's great. Jacqueline and her husband separated a year and a half ago after 18 years of marriage. She and her two sons, 17-year-old Sam and 6-year-old James, had continued to live in the family home, Riversdale House. So what do you two fancy for dinner tonight, then? The San year old pizza again. Pizza, pizza! <laughs> Is that all right with you, Sam? Second time this week. We were always very close, um, simply because she, there was no one else with her. The most in important thing with Jacqueline were the children. Uh, She'd worry all the time for them, making sure they had plenty of clothes, uh, getting their day right from uh, the start. Since her separation, Jacqueline had taken up new interests in her life. She applied for an open university course and became involved in a number of sports. She was socialising more and widening her circle of friends. So do you think you're going to take up tennis then? Or? Well, I, I quite fancy it, but I think it's going to take up too much time, really. Mm. I'd known Jacqueline for about, about 18 months. We were very close. I think we sort of regarded each other as best friends and we used to confide in each other a lot. So if there were problems or if there was anything bothering her, she used to phone me. 
On the day before she died, Jacqueline, as usual, collected James from his school in Crowthorn, four miles away. At around that time, on the opposite side of the road from where the parents normally park, one of the mothers remembers a man in a dark brown hatchback car, possibly a Vauxhall Chevette. The man didn't seem to be watching the school gates. He seemed tense and serious, staring straight ahead of him. Sam? Come on, you're going to be late. Your breakfast is on the table. I knew he shouldn't have stayed up to watch that film. Mum, have you seen that assignment I was working on last night? Yes, you left it on the floor. I put it in your college bag. Oh, no, how can that be? Hello? Oh, hi, Mum. Look, I can't talk now. I'm in a bit of a rush. Yes, we're running late this morning. OK, fine, I'll call you later. Yep, bye. A few hundred yards along the road from Riversdale House is a small office block. The main road through the village is a clear way, and employees arriving for work at about half past eight that morning remember seeing a stranger in their small car park. Maybe she's in your tent. No, it doesn't start till tomorrow. The first thing I noticed was her green scarf, which was covering most of her hair. She made me think that she didn't want to be recognised. Jacqueline would have driven past the car park as she took James to school just before nine o'clock. Ten minutes after that, Chris Gaylor drove through the village. I was on my way to work in uh, Reading. As I came into Eversley, there was a, a brown Chevette type car stopped in front of a house indicating right, but there was no oncoming traffic. I waited behind the, the car for 10 to 20 seconds. He then turned into the, the driveway. As I looked up the drive, there was um, a stone drive with a couple of garages at the end. There was no cars in the driveway. No one saw the car leave Jacqueline's driveway. Was it there when she returned from the school run 10 minutes later? Her mother remembers she sounded her usual self on the phone. Well, actually, I'm going shopping. I've got to go and buy James a new jacket. Yeah. yeah I thought I could try that new shop. Later that morning, the beige car was still parked outside the office block. I noticed the same car in a different parking space. The lady was still in the car, but she'd taken the scarf off her head. She was very, very pale. Red or ginger, short hair. I got the impression that she was very slim. She seemed to be parked outside until at least mid-morning. At about midday, someone saw a smartly dressed man with a clipboard outside Riversdale House. There were plans to sell the house, although it wasn't yet on the market, but perhaps this was an estate agent or a surveyor. He may have seen something significant. At four o'clock, James was still waiting for Jacqueline to collect him from school. Come on, James. Mummy's not here yet. Should we go and tell her? At about half past five, Jacqueline was found in her home. She'd been suffocated. Well, this is such a sad case. Mr. Long, perhaps we could start with the brown hatchback car, which was seen turning into Jacqueline's driveway. Do you think it's the same one that was seen the day before outside the school? It's possible. The driver at the house may have been a male. Certainly the man at the school was definitely a male. Uh, we have a photo fit of that man. He's described as 40 years, uh, sandy-coloured hair, mid-brown, scruffy on the top, um, wearing a white shirt over a grey pullover. He had a particularly pale complexion and looked ill. Right. Now, what about the woman in the beige car? Very important we trace that person. Anybody that would know the identity or the make of the vehicle or knows anyone that's loaned or hired a vehicle that description to such a person, I'd like to know. All right, remember, we're going back to the end of March or the beginning of April. There was a man with a clipboard in the afternoon which just might tie in with a pen you found in Jacqueline's driveway. Yes, yeah, fairly common pen, pen that retails for about 30, 32 pounds in most outlets. It's a shaper pen with a, a zigzag design on it. Yes. 
something we didn't see in the film. At about 11 o'clock in the morning, a man was seen running near Jacqueline's home. He was about 300 yards away, a rather unusual man, wearing a raincoat, jogging bottoms, training shoes, carrying a plastic Sainsbury's bag and another bag that looked like an airline bag. You simply, saw him, you'd remember? Yes, simply like to know who he is. Mm. And some other, something else not in the film, we, um, in Jacqueline's house, we found an open university prospectus with a name on it, Lawrence Gillam, and a time, perhaps, it looks like 10.40. That's quite correct. Uh, the importance of that, she might very well have had an appointment with somebody. We'd like to know who Mr. Gillam is. Please, if you can help, please call us. The number's 081-811-8181 here, or you can call the Basingstoke Police Station direct, and that number's 0256-473-1... ...sless crime, in which a young man became a killer. Perhaps the event started as a prank, or even in preparation for a robbery. But one day, a month ago, in Kirk Langley, outside Derby, things got terribly out of hand. When we first met, we were 14 years old. We were married at 22, and we've been married for 32 years in January. We just lived for each other. We never went anywhere without each other. Uh, we didn't need anyone else. We were just so happy in each other's company. Morning, Mick. Oh, yeah. All right. Mick Pritchard worked as a delivery driver for Business Express. All over the place. Utoxida, Ashbourne. Mind you, there's some lovely places up there. He'd been with the firm for almost 20 years, mainly delivering parcels for the Littlewoods catalogue. He loved his driving, he was such a careful driver. He was asked if he'd want to go for promotion, but he turned it down. All he wanted was to be out in the fresh air, doing a job he loved and helping other people. That day, mixed deliveries took him across his beloved Derbyshire as usual. At ten past three, he was nearing the end of his deliveries. After Quandon, Mick drove the four miles to Kirk Langley now with only 10 parcels left to deliver. I was leaving the school with my son. I got to the end of the road to cross, small lane, to go up to the cunnery. I recognised the van. It was um, the same delivery man that's been coming to the cunnery. I thought for one second that they're going to decline, but they didn't. Nobody cooks puddings much anymore, do they? Oh, it's the catalogue delivery. Oh, go and get the pasta oh, from right. will you? Hey! Hey! Get out of my van! Blimey, I think someone's get... trying to nick his van. Hey! Hey! Get out of my van! Hey! Get... Get out of my van! Hey! Mick had got such high principles of high morality, got a very deep resentment for anything that was wrong. Hey! Stop. Get out of the way! Get out of the way! Get out of the way! Come on. I think he's gone under the van. I'm going to call an ambulance. I could see the delivery driver being dragged underneath the van for about 50 yards down the street. No! No! When the body left the van, I froze. Mick suffered terrible head injuries and died at the scene.
Initially, I thought it was like a road rage between the two van drivers. Once I got onto the A52 and I started to approach the two vans, I realised that they were actually in cahoots with one another. I was driving along the A52 towards Derby and I came by the bottom of Kurt Langley. There was a Mercedes lorry behind me. I just passed the Little Chef restaurant on the left-hand side and just after then, the white parcel van shot in behind me. I could see in the mirror that the lad was agitated and one thing or other. Then just soon after then, the delivery van overtook me. Mick's van was abandoned on the outskirts of Kirk Langley. The Bedford rascal turned around and headed back towards the A52. If he knew that he was going to be late, he always used to ring me. Well, half a state came and there was no phone call, so by this time I was getting really worried. I'm still numb and shocked, and I can't take it in that it's happened. And I'm still thinking that Mick's with me. We just live for each other, and I shall miss him so very, very much. In fact, part of me's died. It really has. Well, Kelvin Ashby, we can all feel huge sympathy for Hillary and, of course, their only son, Jonathan. The question is, why? We've no idea, actually. We, all we know is that these three uh, youths were in the village up to no good, and clearly they've seen the opportunity to steal Mick's van. And you need to find them, and you have some fairly good descriptions of at least two of them, don't you? Yes, we have. Certainly the uh, driver, the killer, he was a male about 19 to 20 years, white, 5 foot 9, medium build, with blonde, fair, collar-length hair, but he was described as having a baby face. And what about the driver of the, we're calling it the Bedford Rascal van, the getaway van? Now, he perhaps didn't actually see what happened, did he? That's right. Whatever took place there was actually behind them and uh, they wouldn't know what has taken place. Uh, he's described, that's the drive the rascal van, as again a white male, 19 to 20 years. We don't know what height he is, he's slim, medium build, with ginger or sandy hair. And the important thing with him is he's got a tooth missing on the upper left side, which is very distinctive, the witnesses tell us. So you definitely need to hear his version of events Yes, as well. we do. We'd like those two to come forward. Now, this getaway van that we're mentioning, you haven't tracked it down, have you, yet? No, we've not. Um, it's still outstanding. All we know about it is it's a, a florist or sandwich-type van, described as possibly a Bedford Rascal, white in colour, and it's uh, an E prefix. So, of course, the question is to link men fitting that description with a van like that. That's right. We, we seek anybody who's got information that can link these three with the white yeah. van. You've had a number of witnesses come forward already, but you need to hear from more people who witness perhaps that erratic belt of driving along the A52. That's right. In particular, the uh, white uh, Mercedes truck driver, uh, he was cut up by the uh, parcel van, and he might be able to provide detailed information about the other van, which is the important one that we need to trace. I just remember when this ha when Remind us when this happened. This is about 3.25pm on Wednesday the 12th of November. As if anyone needs an incentive, there is a reward here, isn't there? Yes, there is. M Mick's company and uh, this union have put up £10,000 for the conviction of these offenders. And who are you appealing to? Well, it's a senseless crime and I would appeal to anybody, and in particular the criminal fraternity. Somebody out there knows who these people are and I would ask them to come forward and give us that information. Kelvin Ashby, thank you very much indeed. Well, Good night. Were you in Hessel, near Hull, on Humberside that evening? Or have you ever taken driving lessons in that part of the world? If so, was your instructor called Keith Slater? On the night of Friday the 26th of August, Keith answered a knock on the door of his home and someone stabbed him to death. Police hope this reconstruction will prompt people who've ever known Keith Slater to come forward and help with the inquiry. Just outside Hessel, there's a wooded area called Little Switzerland. On Friday morning, Keith and his family walked down there for a picnic. Here we go. See both go in the end. Very good, isn't it? Keith had no driving lessons that morning because his car was in for service. But by lunchtime, he'd picked up his car and called into the driving school. 
He was self-employed and had been franchised to the school for the past 16 months. Keith was a keen rugby player who almost always wore his Hessel rugby club tie and sweater while at work. Get yourself comfy. You both in. Make sure your mirror's okay. That's okay. If you just follow the road round. That's it, now careful. That's it. That's fine. He's got right away. He's coming first. That's smashing. That evening at 8.30, Keith's wife, Carol, finished work. She'd just started a part-time job as a cashier. There was a sale on at home base, and she'd had a difficult and busy evening. I had to remember all those codes. I had to print on codes every time I came up with the stuff. Oh. Just before nine, after a little bit of shopping, they arrived at their home on Bonacord Road. The children were staying the night with their grandmother. So the two of them came back to an empty house. But 18 months ago, they blocked his for the last time and moved here. To this after dinner, Keith and Carol spent a quiet evening watching television. But shortly after 10.30, Carol, who wasn't interested in the programme, went to bed. I'm going up now. An hour later, at 11.30, Keith went up too. At midnight, in Northgate, this pub barman was walking home. Can you tell me the way to Bonacord Road? I don't know, sorry. A few minutes later, at Andy Carr's taxis, close to Hessel Square. Alpha 18, 210 Buffet Road, to the Silver Cod. Can you give me directions to Bonacord Road? Yes, if you go to the top, turn left. Follow the road down, and it's first on your right-hand side. Is it past the Norland pub? No. The witnesses describe this man as stocky, with crew-cut hair, and in his twenties or early thirties. If it was you, please call us straight away to be eliminated from this inquiry. Is it the police? The police? Keith Slater. Big help! Keith! No! No! The screams were heard by a couple walking home a block away. They thought it was a party. The couple then saw a young man in a dark coat come out of Bonacord Road. At 12.25, a man was sighted heading towards the footbridge which spans the railway line and Clive Sullivan Way. It's now six weeks since the murder, and police are still anxious to trace everyone who knew Keith Slater and those who learned to drive with him. In particular, they'd like to hear from one young woman. A blonde girl was seen with him several times between February and July at the National Pub on National Avenue in Hull. She was petite, described as stunning, and witnesses remember that she wore a good deal of gold jewellery. Was this you, or do you know who she was? She and Keith were also seen here in Cottingham. She was aged around 20, was smartly dressed, and may well have carried a briefcase. There's another woman detectives need to trace. On the day before the murder, a rugby friend of Keith's flashed his lights at Keith's car on First Lane Anlaby. It was about quarter to nine in the morning. Although Keith's diaries show no lessons booked for that time, a woman with fair or brownish hair was driving the car. Do you know who she was? Mr Lilly, were those two different women or one and the same? 
Well, the evidence uh, is that the descriptions do differ somewhat, but really it is something we must keep an open mind on. Now, there must be suspicions that Keith was having an affair with somebody whose boyfriend or husband didn't like it, or at least he suspected they were having an affair and, and took it out. Yes, this is obviously an area that we've looked at. Um, inquiries have brought forth uh, many useful lines, and that is one of them, yes. Now, obviously, this woman or these women have done nothing wrong themselves. Obviously, if they don't come forward after there's an appeal, there'll be people who are bound to suspect that they're some sort of accessories to, to the murder. But you desperately need these women to come forward. It really is imperative that these two women come forward. It is true to say that they have not committed any offence at this stage, but they really must come forward. I would urge also, of course, that if any relative or friend knows who these people are, then please, please come forward as soon as possible. It really is imperative that we trace these two people. OK, now the man himself, who seems to have known something about the area, We've got quite a good description of him, haven't we? Yes, we have an artist impression which was done by Carol Slater. Uh, Carol saw the assailant fighting with her husband as she came down the stairs, having heard the disturbance. And um, she made an artist impression uh, as a result of that. What I would say, of course, is that that is exactly as Carol remembers him. I wouldn't doubt, uh, feel for one minute that he has such starry eyes if he's sat at home now or indeed in a pub. But we must say, that is as Carol remembers him in the heat of the moment. Now, someone must have suspicions about a boyfriend, a husband, somebody they know who looks a bit like that, but one thing is that he must have got covered in blood that night. Yes, Carol was covered in blood because Keith was um, bleeding quite profusely and she was covered in blood as she helped him back in. The assailant must have been well covered in blood. What I would say is that there must be someone sitting at home who knows that someone came home during the early hours of Saturday the 27th of August covered in blood, acting suspiciously. They must hold a question mark against such a person, and I would urge them, please contact us here or at the police station as soon as possible. If you think you know who that man is, if you think you can help, if you think you know who those women are, if you knew Keith Slater and haven't yet contacted the police, and above all, if you know that woman or those women that were seen with him, please call us right away, 01811 or call the incident room at Hull that's on 501-222. That's 0482, the code for Hull, 501-222. This is an indiscriminate, futile murder. It's the kind of crime that happens luckily very rarely, but that's no consolation for the victim's family and friends. Shirley Leach was a pensioner. She lived in Greater Manchester, and our reconstruction begins in the small hours of Friday the 7th of January in Berry Town Centre. Yeah, it's a good night down there on a Thursday. That's not bad. Have you gone home? Yeah, they got a cab earlier. God, I'm stuffed. Here, have you got any fags left? Yeah, just the one. We'll share it. I'll have to go to the loo first, then. Is there a bog round here? Yeah, there's one in the bus station. Come with us. It's a bit dark. The couple walked to the toilets at the Berry Interchange, the town's central bus depot. Is it? Yeah, okay, I'll be right over. Okay, John, what we've got? It looks like a bad one. There's a female in the toilet. She's aged between. Four. Well, our first priority was to preserve the scene of the crime. We needed to protect the forensic material which was inside there, so we had to make sure it was as secure as possible. I always try to uh, keep a distance emotionally from these sort of things, but I must admit that the first thing I thought when I saw the body lying there was that got a, a poor old lady who's probably never done anybody any harm in her life. She goes into the toilet and her life ends there. We didn't actually identify the body for about 14 hours. It was then that we discovered she was a, an old age pensioner from Berry. Her name was Shirley Leach. Shirley had lived most of her life in Berry and had two grown up children. She'd been widowed nearly two years ago when her husband died of cancer. Hello, Hello, Shirley. Shirley. Hi. For you. She was a very good neighbour, great neighbour. I often used to say to her, 
I hope you never removed from here. Because okay. I'd miss you. The garden's nice and tidy. Is it? Oh. Yes. Oh, I it was just a lovely, kind person who would help anyone, you know, if she could. Do you know it's cold out there, and I'm going uptown later. Oh, yeah? Mm. Yes. Going to meet our Darren. Darren was her only grandchild. The two of them had always been close. Darren, it's my favourite. Listen, who's it back again? It's that uh, culture, uh, culture club. Oh, no, Graham, it's culture beat. Culture beat, that's it. Hey, I'm going to get it. She was a sipper we'll be on. She was young for her age. She loved music. She knew more about music than me. She was well up to date with it all. And she loved buying records. She was more like a mother to me. We used to have a laugh together and spend plenty of time together. Um, we could go out and have a good laugh, have a joke. Um, last time I saw her on 6th of January, when we went to visit my mother in hospital, and we decided to go to the pub. Shirley's journey home meant taking two bus rides, and she and Darren decided to warm up with a drink before setting off. Thanks, love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all right. Put it in your pocket. She is grand. Yeah, she used to look after me. If I was short of money, she used to help me out a bit. <laughs> oh, before I forget, here you are. I've got something for you. With my mum being in hospital, she bought me a few things. It's only milk and lemons. We'd better drink up if we're going to catch our bus. Mm, it's getting off the nine already, isn't it? It is. I could talk to her about anything, any problems that we used to discuss together. We caught the nine o'clock bus together. I got off at my usual stop, and that was the last time I saw my girl. Shirley's bus carried on towards the interchange. Around the same time, a local man, Gary O'Neill, was arriving at the interchange. I was just on my way home from work and I was just walking through the bus station towards the gents' toilets and as I saw a man standing outside. It was quite unusual for anyone to be stood there at that time of night. He was late 40s, early 50s. He was wearing either a grey or beige um, raincoat and a cap and he had a green bag on his shoulder. As I left, he just faced the bus station. It was about ten past nine when Shirley got to the interchange. The connecting bus she'd intended to catch home had just gone. Two of the hospital cleaners recognised her at the bus stop. Have we missed the bus? Yeah. We're always missing it. Four times out of five. What time's next? It'll we'll have to be the uh, 25 to 10 now, won't it? That's another half hour. Hey, let's go and have a look at the monkey timetable, see what time that goes. Sheila was obviously annoyed at missing the bus, and a few minutes later I saw her crossing the interchange, wondered where she was going, and then I assumed she was going to the tower, and that's the last time we saw Sheila. About 15 minutes later, some teenagers were chatting nearby. The scream came from the direction of the toilets. What was that? Probably someone messing about or something. Oh, look, it's gone. At around the same time, yeah. these two sisters were on their way home after a game of bingo. We'd have caught that. I told you we shouldn't have played that last game. I'm gonna get home now. Me and Joan were talking, she were worried she'd missed the bus. And I happened to glance to the ladies' toilets. Yeah, we're going to get home now, old oh, oh, old Joan, the last game. what's that man yeah. doing going in, ladies? Oh, oh look, what's he doing now? They had his back to me the old time. They were around five foot six to five foot nine. They went out of my view then. Police believe it was around this time that Shirley Leach was murdered. No one seems to have seen the man leave the interchange. We're obviously looking for somebody who is mentally disturbed. He needs to be caught very quickly. He needs medical help. The particular worry we have is that this was a, a horrendous crime to commit. She was butchered, she was sexually assaulted. And I just thought, what's the world coming to? 
Well, Mr. Maskew, that was such a tragic case. Shirley used to make that journey every night for two weeks to visit her daughter in hospital, and that was the first time she'd ever missed her connecting bus. That's right. She, it was the first time she'd ever missed a bus. But even if it had happened on other occasions, quite often she'd been accompanied by other members of the family when she'd made that journey. So if that had happened on other nights, it would not have made any difference. But it was the first time she was on her own as well. Indeed, yes. What sort of person do you think could have done this? Clearly a very dangerous individual. If anything, Shirley was a little bit more timid than the actress portrays it in the reconstruction, and certainly she was smaller in build. She was clearly a vulnerable victim, who I think was selected for that particular purpose. Three people altogether have described the man we saw there in the film loitering at the very interchange. Do you think all those three people actually are describing the same man? Certainly the descriptions are very similar, the one exception being about the top coat that uh, he's seen when he's first seen outside the gent's toilet. That anorak with the drawstring is not visible on the other two sightings. But nevertheless, the remaining description is so similar that I think it could well be the, main, the same man. Although, obviously, I can't exclude the possibility there may be more than one. Mm. The last sighting, in terms of time, was at about ten past ten that Thursday night, wasn't it? That's right. That's at ten past ten, and it's a young girl who's waiting at a bus queue when she sees the man walking across the interchange. And he is, in fact, leaving the interchange at that point onto Anglin Way. He's holding to his face a white tissue or a white handkerchief, which is blood-stained, and he could well have been bleeding from the face. What precisely is the description you have now of this man? It's a compilation from the three witnesses, and he's aged between 40 and 50 years of age, 5 feet 7 to 5, eight in 5 feet 8 inches tall, and certainly on the night of the murder, he was wearing a sports coat or suit-type jacket, a flat cap, or as a hairstyle which creates that impression. Any indication at all for you where he might have come from? Now that's a difficult one. It's, it's a busy bus station where the incident occurred and it's also the Metrolink for the tram services in Manchester. He could in fact have come from anywhere in the country. How are you hoping that viewers tonight might be able to help? Hoping by someone may recognise the man from the description and the reconstruction. It may be someone they know, particularly females. It may be someone that they feel uncomfortable in his presence. He meets the criteria in terms of age and height. And it may be some other thing that uh, means that they're connecting with this incident. And if that's the case, I would ask that they please contact. And, of course, anybody else who may have seen the man answering that description on that night. Anyone else with any information whatsoever. It's such a dreadful crime is this that I really do appeal to people. If they've got any information, to make contact with me. Mr Maskery, thank you very much. And just to remind you, we're talking about the evening of Thursday, the 6th of January, at the Berry Interchange bus um, terminal. If you can help, please call us here in the studio. This is the number here, 0500 600 600. Or you can ring the incident room direct, and that number is 061 856 838. Heard became the first postman to be murdered in connection with his work in nearly four centuries of the postal service. It's difficult to figure why someone would want to steal pre-Christmas letters. It's harder still to imagine why anyone would be prepared to kill for them. David Heard lived all his life in Sheffield and all his life had gone to see United. He had two great passions, his football and his family. My life now is non-existent. I don't feel as though I've got a life because the love of my life is dead. See ya. David had spent 31 years working for the Royal Mail. David loved his work. He enjoyed the outdoors, driving, and he never ever complained about getting up, going to work early, or coming in late at night. At 5.50 p.m. on Monday the 15th of November, Andrea Bray was in Fraser Crescent, Woodseats. I suddenly heard some footsteps at the back, and I turned round and saw two lads. I remember the two lads because they came up behind me and startled me. I turned around to look at them, and they'd gone down the grass verge. Both the boys were young. Could they have been you? <coughs> Next day, Tuesday the 16th of November. Hello, love. You all right? David used to ring me up nearly every day to see if I was all right, and he rang at quarter past four, asked if I was all right. Love you too. I'll have your supper ready for you when you get in. Bye, love. And that was the last conversation I had with David. 
Soon after calling Jean, David set off on his last collection. At 10 to 5, Andrea Bray was once again in Fraser Crescent. I was coming home from work and I got up to the post box at the bottom and the mousy haired boy I'd seen the night before was stood on the corner, just stood there with his hands in his pockets. It sent Todd because he was just loitering around. Moments later, the van was seen travelling at high speed, following a dark cavalier. This is half a mile away from the letterbox. It's Lindburn Road, where, as it happens, a resident was expecting a delivery. Hey, sounds like a van. Go and have a look, then. I knew he went to postman. He wasn't wearing a uniform. He wasn't old enough to be a postman. He wasn't old enough to be nothing. Come here. What's the matter? Well, look at him here. What's he doing? He was about five foot six, five foot eight, uh, slim build, very fresh face. He looked as though he'd never had a shave in his life. He was a young lad. He sat in the front of the van and he shot round as though somebody shouted him from behind. Where's he going now? He's moved to the back of the van. There's another, another lad with him. The second guy, he was like stocky built. He was maybe about five foot eight. His hair was very unkept. He walked across to the car, which was a dark cavalier. He got something out of the car, then moved to the back of the post office van. Can you see what they're doing? No, I don't know. The movement seemed as though they were moving stuff out the back of the van into the back of the car. Wait, he's coming back. The driver of the van walked back round to the front of the van and then wiped the door handle and walked back. They got into the right on the back seat of the car and they drove off. I'm going to phone post office. Meanwhile, back in Fraser Crescent, a motorist saw someone lying in the road. David Hurd was still alive, but he had massive injuries to his chest. Although an ambulance arrived in minutes, he died before he got to hospital. I don't know if I'll ever get over it at all. But come time, and with people's help, I hope I do. But I shall never stop loving David. John Booth. David had been hit on the back of the head. He'd, he'd then been run over in his own van. Why? I mean, was there any money on board? No, there was four postal packets removed from the van, but there was no monetary value whatsoever in the van at all. 
They're quite extraordinary. You've got pretty good descriptions of these two lads, uh, particularly the younger one, whatever he is, 16 years old, something yes, like that. Yes, he's 16, 17 years of age, 5 foot 6 tall, slim build, with short, dark hair, which is evenly cut, very clean shaven, doesn't look as though he's shaved, very really clean shaven. Described a sort of baby face, really. That's right. and, and, and the other one, who's a bit, what, 2, 3 years old? Yes, he's like 80 to 20 years of age, 5 foot 8 tall, average build, fair hair, which was very unkempt. Now, the, the, va the vehicle that they were in, it seems, this, this Vauxhall Cavalier, you've got a rather better description than we uh, gave yes, it's, in Reconstruction. That's right. It's a Mark II Cavalier, which, which ranges from X, X to F registrations. It's a five-door hatchback, and it is dark in colour, and that is still to be traced. Now, you've made a lot of inquiries in Sheffield, and now you've actually had a huge response. Everybody's been trying to help on this one. Could this have been organised from outside Sheffield? That's right. We're now in the ninth week of the investigation. There's been a great deal of response from the local people of South Yorkshire. Many inquiries have already been, been undertaken. But we're now looking further afield. Uh, in particular, uh, we've got teams of detectives working in the Manchester area and on offences that have taken place of a similar nature elsewhere in the country. You still need to eliminate those two lads we showed in the reconstruction who were seen there the, the night before. I mean, if, if somebody has heard something on the streets, if somebody's heard some gossip, if somebody's got some suspicions, it's always difficult, basically, to shop somebody yes. that you know, particularly if you care for them. Right. All I would say to those individuals is that if they ring and contact myself or the incident room at Ecclesfield Police Station, any information that is given to us will be dealt with in the strictest of confidence and will be taken through and dealt with in, in that nature. Okay. I should say there is an enormous reward on this, very, very big for normal criminal inquiries. £50,000 for information leading to conviction. So if you can help in any way with this case, the number here in the studio is 0500 600 600. Or you can call South Yorkshire Police at uh, another free call number, 0500 400 200. That's 0500 400 200. For all those 20 years, and indeed was the first reconstruction we ever showed. It's a macabre story made even more bizarre by this letter that was sent to the police by a man who claims to be the murderer. Do you recognise the style? It may have been written with a ruler and a mapping pen. And look in particular at those peculiar S's that are written in the form of exclamation marks. It's a bit like some computer shorthand. Now, the letter could be a decoy, it could be a hoax. But if you know who wrote it, you could save someone's life. In fact, now police fear that in the 20 years since, the culprit must have struck again, and probably repeatedly so. Two decades ago, Chris Barnfather was a young detective in Nottinghamshire Constabulary. This remains the most emotionally draining case he has ever dealt with. All those years, he stuck with it. The victim was Colette Aram. 20 years on, Chris reviews the original film and reveals new evidence. Well, Colette was abducted from the side of the road. She was probably struck at that time. She certainly had a head injury, which would support that. She was dragged into a vehicle. She would have been terrified. She was driven two miles up the road, probably fighting in the back of the vehicle. She was dragged from the vehicle where she had her clothing removed, and she was subjected to the most appalling and violent sexual attack. She was then strangled, and she was left to die in a field a few miles from her home. The police have built up a picture of the killer's movements from the letter and from corroborating evidence. I was in a hut for hours waiting for a girl to return from horse riding. No one saw me. About five miles from Keyworth, there are riding stables there. Young girls, predominantly, exercise the horses on a Sunday afternoon. Sometime before four o'clock on that particular Sunday, a man was seen loitering around an old hut which is next to the stables. I say, oh man, I believe that's our man. Certainly there's evidence that that man was inside the hut. We found a piece of rag which was semen stained, which indicates he was there for some sort of sexual excitement, no doubt evoked by the young girls on horseback. He saw his opportunity when the Ford Fiesta turned up, stole it and drove away in the direction of Keyworth. This whole tragic sequence of events that led to Colette's brutalised death started with the theft of that motor vehicle.
this individual spent over three hours in the Keyworth area, driving around, looking for a young girl. He certainly followed other young girls that afternoon. He made approaches to other young girls. They were fortunate. Colette wasn't. She left home shortly after eight. She was certainly seen at about five past eight by friends who acknowledged her. She was seen again at 10 past eight by people who knew her. At 8.15, only five minutes later, a resident heard screams outside of his home. Repeated screams and shouts of no. He went to the door. He could see nobody. He saw a vehicle driving away at speed. Nobody saw Colette Aram alive again. The Generous Britain's a small village pub about five miles from Keyworth. It doesn't entertain many passing customers, mostly local. He engaged in conversation with the landlady. That conversation tended to indicate he had some knowledge of the area. The landlady actually noticed while serving him that on the back of his right hand he had blood, quite visible blood stains in the creases of his hand. He appeared to have noticed that she noticed and was bothered by that. Uh, where's the toilet? Oh, just back there. When Colette was found to be missing, there was an extensive search conducted throughout the village by members of her immediate family and her boyfriend's family. That continued throughout the night, obviously, with police assistance. At about 9.20 the following morning, police officers were called to a field on the outskirts of Keyworth off Thirlby Lane, where a body of a young female had been found. Unfortunately, the grandfather and the brother of Colette saw officers attending and actually followed them onto the field area. And there they were to see the horrifying sight of Colette lying naked and brutalised in that field. A fact that the police have never released before, because we always like to hold a little bit back, is the fact that Colette had had an item of clothing actually tied to her wrist. It wasn't an item that had been used in any way to restrain her or to incapacitate her. It was tied there almost as a, a sign to whoever found her. The way her body was posed has never been released before. She wasn't left with any dignity. She was left in a position which could only horrify anybody who stumbled across her body. The resting of her clothing had been thrown into a culvert, but an item of jewellery was missing, almost as if the offender had taken a trophy and had left his victim in a field displayed for all. That was all 20, 21 years ago. This is Colette's mother, Jackie Kirkby. Um, 21 years, but presumably hasn't got any easier. No, it hasn't. I don't think it ever does, and I think any mother would tell you the same thing. It's 21 years in October, and I remember it as if it was yesterday. Um, you know, I go out and I see girls that Colette was at school with. They've got young children. I would probably be the same now, I'd be a grandmother um, to children that Colette would possibly have had. Um, it's, it's very, very difficult. It's something that you never ever come to terms with. And the one person I think that really has suffered in all of this is, is my son. He actually saw Colette in that field and I always remember him saying to me, Mum, you didn't see the way she was lying there. I did. And he'll never forget that. He'll take that to his grave with him. And things like this, it, you never get over it. Um, it. Well, it's just terrible and I would never wish this on anyone. And Chris, the frightening thing is this isn't just an old case. This could be happening to other people, perhaps not murder, but you think this man is a serial offender? It's almost inevitable, I think, Nick, that this individual will have sexually assaulted before he killed Colette and probably sexually assaulted since. Now, we've got partial DNA, so if people have got any suspicions about somebody, you can easily eliminate. You've also got an EFIT, but you're very concerned that people shouldn't take this too literally because there have been a lot of conflicting descriptions of the man. Absolutely. Witnesses gave different descriptions at the time. And although it's maybe a backcloth for viewers to actually focus on, I'd actually ask them to try and connect maybe that image with 
was this individual in the Kiwa Theatre at the time living there, maybe visiting there, maybe working there? He obviously knew it, and the one thing that we do know is pretty accurate is the hair. He had sort of thick, curly, curly black yes, hair, was it, or dark hair anyway. All the witnesses were, um, were very united on that issue. He'd now be mid-40s or early 40s, perhaps around 40 years of age, we're not entirely sure. What about uh, body height and uh, body and height and that sort of thing? Oh, probably 5 foot 10 inch muscular build. So maybe putting on a bit of weight now. And as you say, he must have had local connections. He must have got there somewhere, if, uh, somehow, if he didn't have his own, his own car. And this fetish for stalking girls. Now, this is a behaviour he presumably exhibited at other stages and has exhibited since. I would suspect so, yes. He, he clearly had followed a number of young girls around in the Keyworth area on that night before he actually found Colette. So there'll be perhaps police officers elsewhere in the country, prison officers, psychiatric social workers, psychiatrists and so forth, people who may see somebody and I've seen them recently, with a similar method of operation. Yes, I, I believe this man may well have gone through the prison system at some point in time, subsequent to Colette's killing, and I would appeal to those professionals to come forward to us tonight. The taunting with the letter. One wonders if he might be watching Crime Watch and, and might ring you tonight, might ring here. I would invite him to phone me. You'd invite him? I should make the point, incidentally, that no calls to Crime Watch. We always say this publicly, no calls to Crime Watch are ever traced. So if he, if he does ring, you can't trace him, no, but you not. still want him to call. We don't record them either, incidentally. It's an opportunity to speak to him and maybe to uh, understand why this occurred. Jackie, having lived with us for 21 years, what would you say to anybody who... They're not sure it's somebody, but they've just got their faintest suspicion. They think, well, I can't ring on the faintest of suspicions. I would ask them to just find it in their hearts to phone whether they got a slight suspicion or not. Maybe then we can put behind us, well, we won't put behind us because you know, we never will, but at least we might get to know the reasons why and get to know with satisfaction that he's behind bars and he's not going to be in a position to do this again. Well, you can talk openly if you call us here or if you prefer you can talk in confidence to any of the detectives and there are BBC staff here too gathered here in the studio or you can call the local incident room on 011 59 672 954. The first case this month is one of those bewildering crimes where it's hard to see a motive. It's difficult to imagine why anyone would want to cause the tragedy they did. As you watch our reconstruction, is there someone you can help eliminate and is there anyone you suspect could be involved? It took place in Suffolk four months ago. At the age of 21, Karen Hales had been a mother for 18 months. She lived all her life in Ipswich in Suffolk, worked part-time in Boots, but she spent every hour she could with Emily. Karen was a very caring rebel. She was very bubbly, real outgoing girl, full of confidence and devoted to Emily and her mother. Wasn't she, Jamie? Yes, she was. She's very special to all of us. A lovely daughter and my best friend. She's very caring, too caring. I thought of other people more than she did herself. I met Karen at school. One day she came up to me and asked me out very openly. That made me feel good. That's the sort of person she is to sort of come up to you and sort of speak her mind. Um, we went out with each other for six years. We were very happy together in them years. When she got pregnant, we were very happy. So we went and bought a house. They bought a starter home in Ipswich in Lavenham Road and had lived there for a couple of years. On Saturday, the 20th of November, Peter had gone out with workmates.
Karen was too frightened to call out. Peter? Sorry, were you asleep? Oh, no. No, how did it go? Oh, all right. We just went up the swan. Everything right here? Well, um, no, I had a bit of a fright. I was sitting in the living room and I thought I heard a noise. So I went to the front door and somebody was trying that. Although their house hadn't been anything? targeted up to no, now, there had been a spate of break-ins in the area. Well, no, they weren't there for very long. Well, it's probably only kids anyway. Yeah. The next day was Sunday the 21st of November. Karen, where are my socks? They're in the second drawer. Right, come on then. Put that down. Say so long to Daddy, then. There we go. All right, love. See you later. All right. Oh, wait. Oh, I've still got time to take you over to your mum's if you want to go. No, it's all right. Me and Emma are going to clean, aren't we? Oh, all right. Bye. I'll see you later. Bye-bye, Emily. Peter was on a late shift and had to go to work at 4 o'clock that afternoon. Near Ipswich Town Centre is the bus garage where Peter works. At 4.15 or so, Karen's parents called to see him. Is that you, Peter? Oh, all right. How are you doing? All right. Wondered if you could have a look at the car. It's the starter motor's playing up again. Ah, no Wait, problem. Peter, you got a spanner? No, Nigel's got it. Hey, is Karen at home? Yeah, I asked if she wanted to come over to you, but she said she'd rather stay at home and get some housework done. Ah, oh, well, we'll pop round and see her in a minute. Two locals were taking a short cut into Lavenham Road, near Karen and Peter's house. We saw a man. I was going to ask the time, but I didn't get a chance because he was walking so fast. All I remember about him was he was wearing a parka with uh, grey fur around the hood. The man walked out onto the main London road, where a couple were driving home. She looked better, but she still looks tired. What on earth is he doing? We noticed a chap barely agitated in the central reservation. As we got closer to him, I thought, he's going to make a dash for it. And sure enough, right at the last minute, he did. I thought he was suicidal. He was wearing a dark parka coat with a grey trim. He appeared to be slim build, dark short hair, around about 20, 25. About now, the two boys were passing Karen's home. We were walking across the green, when I looked over that house, is that smoke over there? That's just condensation. Mm. A local oh, resident was in Chantry Park, about 400 yards away. Hello, Whiskey. Come on, then. There's a good boy. I decided to take the dog for a walk, and had just left the car park and noticed a person moving in the distance. I noticed him because he was running bent over. And then he hesitated and stopped and stared. And I just felt that he was acting strangely and thought he'd been up to no good. I suppose he was aged about 20 to 30 years old and he was wearing a blue gray parka coat with a hood. About the same time, Karen's parents reached Lavenham Road. Karen? Karen? It's funny it's open. Karen was discovered by her father. She'd been stabbed several times and her body had been set alight. Her daughter Emily was in the same room but had not been injured. 
there's any mum out there that is hiding anything. They just want to imagine what it's like. Every morning, Emily cries for mummy. During the day, she's asking where mummy is. We, Peter and I, do the best we can, and Graham, but we don't take the place of mummy. John Saunders, why? I mean, what's your guess? Why did it happen? We don't really know what the motive was in this case. As you can see, Karen was a loving, caring person with no enemies at all. What we do know is that items were stolen from the house, so we cannot rule out the possibility that it was a burglary. This um, is an identical purse to the one that uh, was stolen. Now, this is a fairly common sort of purse. Uh, lots of these around in Britain, so please don't ring us just because you've seen one. But we are interested, presumably, if you've seen one thrown away around the Ipswich area. Yes, certainly anything that, of that nature that's been discarded since November we would be extremely interested in, or whether anyone's been in possession of that. And uh, a couple of knives as well. Again, the, the thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of these in the UK, they don't just ring us about these, they're laser knives. It's just if you've seen them thrown away in a bin or under a hedge or, or something like that in a way that could be, could be connected to this. You want more, more witnesses in, in Lavenham Road, I gather, still, despite all your extensive inquiries? Yes, we've traced over a thousand people in connection with the inquiry, but we still have people unidentified that we can't put names to. This guy wearing the parka, just go into his description a bit more for us. Yes, he's described by various witnesses, and it may be that there's more than one person wearing a parka, but it's a parka with a fur hood. He's aged between 20 and 30, about 5 feet 10 tall slim build with thin uh, dark hair uh, which is cut fairly short. And whoever killed Karen would have been presumably heavily bloodstained. Yes, I'm certain that that's the case, that uh, clothing would have been heavily bloodstained and I would appeal for anyone who knows of somebody who was bloodstained on that day or who's discarded their normal clothing to contact us. Sunday the 21st of November, there's a reward as though that was necessary in a case as, you know, really despicable as this. If you can help anyway, the number here in the studio is 0500 600 600. Or you can ring the incident room at Suffolk Police Headquarters. That's 0473 613 This year, you might be able to help solve our first case tonight. Since last Christmas, David Short had worked for Danham Windows as their East Kent representative. Ten weeks ago, on the evening of Thursday, the 22nd of September, he was murdered. Despite quite precise information about his movements that night, police have so far drawn only blanks in the search for his killer. Our reconstruction begins in the seaside town of Broadstairs, where David lived. Broadstairs is a popular holiday resort between Ramsgate and Margate on the southeast coast. Perched high above the town is Bleak House, which a century ago inspired Charles Dickens' novel. David Short was 36. He'd lived in Broadstairs for most of his life and had done a variety of jobs. Every day he exercised his dogs around the Ethel Road area, where for the past nine months he'd lived with his common-law wife, Michelle. Two years ago, David was working in a well-known local hotel as a barman. One night a barmaid recalls there was a visit by two men. Oi, mate! Any more trouble from you and I'll bleed and kill you. Have you got that? What was that all about? Nothing. A week later, David reported to work with a swollen face and black eyes. David used to frequent various night spots in Margate and Ramsgate, and police are anxious to talk to anyone who may have seen him in these clubs. They'd also like to speak to somebody called Mags, who David met apparently while working as a barman. In January of this year, David left bartending and started selling double glazing, a job he'd done in the past. Good afternoon. I called the other day, uh, Danham Windows. Oh, Mr. Short. Yes, right. we're expecting you. Would you like to come in? Thanks very much. How are the kids? Thank you. Go through. Thank you. Well, why don't I show you a couple of our brochures? Uh, this includes our latest top-of-the-range bestseller, which uh, features an aluminium frame with a hardwood surround. Over the years, David had worked for several companies. Perhaps he sold double glazing to you. I'll just look at the frame, because that's coming out. Oh, no problem there. And measure up. Get to your quote in no time. Business was going very well for David, and he bought a distinctive white Rover car. But if you saw the car recently, you almost certainly noticed the damage to the paintwork. 
About a month before his death, someone had vandalised his car with paint stripper while it was parked outside his home. Someone obviously had a grudge against him and knew exactly where he lived. Two weeks before David was murdered, a neighbour noticed a short, dark-haired man with a moustache arguing with David on his doorstep. She thought perhaps it had something to do with his business. On Thursday, the 22nd of September, the day David died, he returned home from an afternoon appointment to cook the evening meal. It was about half past five when he sat down to eat with Michelle and his mother, who'd come over for dinner. They had a discussion about the new house David and Michelle were hoping to buy together. I think you're going to like living in Dickens Road. Until we've signed on that dotted line, I'm not taking anything for granted. Don't worry. I went, I went to the estate agents today. They've yeah. taken the sign down. Yeah. They have. Oh, well, yeah. that's something. Yeah. We'll be in by Christmas. I'm sure we will be I in by Christmas. I hope so. Across the road, a neighbour saw Michelle and David's mother leaving the house on their way to play bingo in Ramsgate. That was about seven o'clock. Ten minutes later, she saw David leaving, smartly dressed and carrying a briefcase. His diary shows an appointment in Deal, and the witness remembers he sat in the car for a few minutes before driving off. Four and three. Forty-three. One and two. Number twelve. All the sixes. Sixty-six. It was a quarter to nine when David returned home. There was a yellow Vauxhall Chevette parked across the road. It had broken down and the owner had gone off for help. At a quarter past nine, just around the corner from David's home, a witness on St Peter's Park Road saw a motorcyclist preparing to ride off. Police would like him to come forward. At about twenty past nine, the owner of the broken down Chevette came back with his brother. They've told police that in the 20 minutes or so it took them to tow the car away, they don't remember seeing the white rover. So had David gone out again? And if so, where? At about the same time, a quarter of a mile away, another witness saw two men shouting in a car. The woman and child walking nearby may remember seeing the orange or red-coloured old-type saloon car. It stopped just around the corner, outside the Albion public house. At a quarter to ten, David's mother and Michelle left the bingo hall in Ramsgate. In the 15 minutes it took them to get home, David was murdered. His body was lying on the pathway by two broken milk bottles. At about the same time, a man was seen running down this nearby alleyway. When the police and ambulance arrived, it was discovered that David had been sprayed in the face with CS gas and hit on the head twice with a heavy object. Delta Alpha 30, Delta Alpha 30. In charge of this case is Detective Chief Inspector David Birchell. Mr. Birchell, what sort of man was David Short? Well, to be frank, he wasn't very popular. Um, he was a person who had, uh, had many threats made to him. Uh, two people, some two years prior to him being murdered, threatened him in the Castle Keep Hotel, where he worked, and shortly after that he was beaten up. A month before he died, someone poured paint stripper over his car, uh, causing considerable damage, and we still don't know who did that. And the person who called on him ten days beforehand, who was on his doorstep, who we still haven't traced, was arguing with him. We are interested in uh, the two people at the Castle Keep and that man. So it sounds as though there could be many possible motives for his death. There are. We've investigated many things, but we're still not clear about what the actual motive is. His social life seems to have been reasonably colourful. Yes, indeed it was. He was a person who enjoyed himself and went around the nightclubs in Margate and Ramsgate. And you wanted to find this person called Mags. Any clues on that? We haven't. We know that he was friendly with a person called Mags. We've put appeals out locally, but we've had no response. Anyone by the name of Mags who was associated with David Short, we'd like to hear from. Now, as I said in the film, CS gas was sprayed in David's face. Where could that have come from? Because it's illegal to sell it in this country. It is indeed. Um, there are two canisters here. Um, they are obtainable in France. 
and we'd like to hear from anyone who knows of anyone who had possession of CS gas in that type of canister, particularly people from Kent. We'd also like to hear from a man, an anonymous caller, who called the incident room shortly after the murder. He told us that CS gas had been obtained in Dover to do a job in Margate. That man promised to come back to us. He hasn't, and we'd like to hear from him. Right, please do call us. And uh, finally, could you recap them on the several people who were seen near David's house on the night that he died? Yes, as the appeal shows, we're looking particularly for three lots of people. There was a man on a motorcycle at 9.15 seen near to his house. We know that there were two men in a car who were arguing about a quarter of a mile away from his house, and the man was seen running away from the scene of the crime round about the time the ambulance arrived. He was in St. Peter's Park Road, Broadstairs. So these people need to come forward if only to be eliminated from your inquiries? Yes, and we can assure time. we'll treat them with discretion if, in fact, they do come forward. Right. They can save police a lot of time, wasted time if you can come forward and be eliminated from the inquiries, and maybe you saw something significant. Just to remind you, it was Thursday, September the 22nd. If you can help Mr. Birchall and any of his team with any information at all, do please ring us. The number here to the studio is 01811 or you can ring the incident room direct and that number is 0843 22